How do you receive the power of the Holy Spirit? You receive the power of the Holy Spirit by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the moment that you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, the fullness of his presence and power comes to dwell in you. If you believe that the power of the Holy Spirit dwells in you, if you believe that the same Holy Spirit who was in Christ, who was upon the disciples and within their ministries, that same Holy Spirit who manifested his power in the book of Acts chapter 2, if you believe you have that Holy Spirit, if you believe he's within you, write this in the comment section, he lives in me. Write that whether you're watching live or on replay. Let that be your public declaration of faith. This truly is the starting point. If you want to understand the workings of the Holy Spirit in your life, because of religious mindsets, because of certain Christian culture, because of some thought processes that come down that were handed to us from people who didn't quite understand the word, we sometimes imagine that the Holy Spirit is someone that we have to work to receive. We imagine that the Holy Spirit is only for the super spiritual elite. There's no such thing. There's no such group as the spiritually elite. Because not only could you not desire to be spiritual without the help of the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be able to live in that desire without the help of the Holy Spirit. He gives you the desire for holiness, he gives you the desire for spirituality, and he helps you to walk in that same power. So there is no such group of spiritually elite. It's not as if God is withholding his power, waiting for you to perform. See, we imagine that first comes performance and then comes power, when in fact God gives us the power that we might be able to perform. And no, I'm not talking about performing in the sense of doing a show for others. I'm talking about living out that life that God has destined you to live. And so it really begins at salvation. You do not receive a baby Holy Spirit at salvation. You do not receive a portion of the Holy Spirit at salvation. For how can the eternal be divided into portions? No, the moment you are born again, the Holy Spirit in the fullness of his presence and power comes to dwell in you. There's no working to obtain him. There's no step one, two, three to get him. The moment you are born again, you've received him. And I think this is especially prevalent, this mindset that I'm referencing. This is especially prevalent in certain Christian cultures that emphasize the spiritual gifts. I believe in the spiritual gifts. I practice the spiritual gifts. I believe in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. You watch this channel for any length of time and you're going to know. I believe in speaking in tongues, casting out devils, praying for the sick, the slaying power of the Holy Ghost, miracles and manifestations of his power, of course I believe that. But I think that sometimes in certain circles of Christianity, especially in our circles, this mindset becomes prevalent. This idea that the Holy Spirit is being withheld from me by God until that day that I please him. I couldn't please him without the Holy Spirit, so that would be a catch-22. Let me show you what the Bible says. Let me pull up a scripture here, and it's going to be found in Romans chapter 8, and then I'm going to read verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says this. Go there in your Bibles, and then if you're writing notes, write this down. Romans 8, 9 says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, this is key right here, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. Now jump down, let's read verses 14 through 16. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God, so you have not received the Spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba Father. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So the Holy Spirit is needed in order for you to become a child of God. And the scripture says that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a child of God. Read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The Bible is perfectly clear that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you the moment you are saved, and I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit doesn't leave his power behind. 
I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit doesn't come to dwell on you and say, well, I couldn't bring my power with me until you reached a certain level in your Christianity. That would be nonsensical and inconsistent with everything that the Scripture teaches in regards to the nature and power of the Holy Spirit. No, when He comes to dwell in me, He brings His power with Him. And when He brings His power with Him, He fully expects that you and I will live in that power. Again, not a baby Holy Spirit, not a portion of the Holy Spirit, but the fullness of his power, the very same which rested on the Christ, the very same which was active in the ministries of the disciples, the very same that was active in the ministry of Paul the Apostle, the very same that stirred David to write the Psalms, that stirred Solomon to write the Proverbs, that moved the prophets of old to declare the oracles of God, that revealed the coming of the Messiah, the very same Holy Spirit who in the book of Genesis hovered above the face of the deep, this precious Holy Spirit dwells in you and I. I'll tell you, if you want to get me stirred up, just start talking about the Holy Ghost. I love the Holy Spirit. And so, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in me in fullness the moment I am saved. That very instant, let us be rid of this religious ideology that would teach us that we have to perform in order to receive. No, 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 my friend. The moment you are saved, the moment you receive Christ as Lord, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. Salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. How could the Holy Spirit manifest the miracle of salvation in your life if he wasn't present in your life the moment that you were saved? So why then do we talk of this what seems like a second experience? Why then do we teach that you have to seemingly receive him a second time? And this is what's caused a lot of confusion in Christian circles, and it's what's caused debates that are totally unnecessary, where people talk about the fact that you need to let him have his influence in your life. It's always the religious who get angry at that. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, you know, you shouldn't say welcome Holy Spirit, because if you say welcome Holy Spirit, you're... You're, you're forgetting the fact that the Holy Spirit is everywhere at all times, Psalm 139, 7. You're forgetting that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, Romans 8, 9. No. When we say we invite the Holy Spirit, what we are saying is, Holy Spirit, I surrender to that influence. I surrender to what you want to do. I choose to walk in obedience to the voice that you use to speak to me. I choose to walk in obedience to the instructions that you give me through the whispers of the Spirit. I choose to obey the Word. I choose to obey the Spirit. That's what we mean when we say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Holy Spirit, we invite you. We are surrendering that moment, surrendering our lives, surrendering our minds, surrendering our emotions and bodies to that work of the Holy Ghost. Now, we see this in the Scripture all the time. Uh, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 8. I'm going to show you something that many people miss, actually, and if they do see it, they're confused by it, they, they have questions about it, and then they just dismiss it and move on and never really come back to full understanding of this. And this, I'm admitting, confused me for a while. I read this, Acts chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 14 through 17, watch this. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. Now watch this. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. I was so confused. I said, Lord, the scripture declares in Romans, in Ephesians, in various other epistles, that salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. That sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit. That that belief that I'm given unto salvation is stirred by the Holy Spirit. So why then? Does the Bible call these individuals believers who had not yet received the Holy Spirit? Interesting. Verse 16, the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. Very key phrasing there. Upon and within, that's a whole different message for a whole different time, but we'll continue. For they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now... We see in the New Testament, that example that was just given, that there are believers who have the Holy Spirit, but still needed to surrender their lives to Him in a new way. There was a dimension of power that they had left untapped because they had not come into the awareness of the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you another example. Go to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. 
While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Now watch this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked. And they replied, the baptism of John, which was the baptism of repentance. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And then, of course, John, we know, said that Jesus would baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here we see another example of who the Bible refers to as believers. They believed, and they could only believe if they had the Holy Spirit. So they believe unto salvation, which is a work of the Holy Spirit, but they hadn't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. Is this a contradiction? Is the Bible arguing against itself? By no means. Rather, this is describing two different realities that both come from the same Holy Spirit. Now, I'll show you an example of this as we glean through the New Testament certain instances from certain narratives. For example, Luke chapter 10. Jesus sends out his disciples, right? He says, okay, go preach, go heal the sick, go cast out devils. Well, they were anointed to preach, heal the sick, and cast out devils if Jesus gave them that power. Now, what was that power that they used to preach, cast out devils, and heal the sick? It was none other than the power of the Holy Ghost. How do we know this? Because even Jesus relied upon that power. He didn't even begin his ministry till after his baptism and the Holy Spirit came upon him. When the Pharisees were criticizing the Lord and saying that he was casting out devils by the devil, Jesus rebuked them and then told them that if I by the Spirit of God am casting out devils, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. So Jesus in that instance is showing us that the power to cast out devils that he was using was of the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus used the power of the Holy Spirit to preach, to heal the sick, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. There again, we see an example of Jesus using the power of the Holy Spirit. I can give you more references for that. You'll see it as you look through the life of Jesus, that Jesus used the power of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. So then Jesus takes this power imparts it to the disciples, the disciples receive it, and then they go about using it. So here we see that the disciples received the Holy Spirit, at least upon them, maybe not within them for the work of salvation, 1 John 2, 27, but upon them for the work of ministry, Acts 1, 8, but ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now watch, this same group of disciples, not all of them, but some of them were present in John chapter 20, verse 22, when Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask you a question. If Jesus breathes on you and says, receive the Holy Spirit, do you think you're going to receive the Holy Spirit? Absolutely, positively, you will receive the Holy Spirit if Jesus himself breathes upon you and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So this same group, at least a portion of this group from Luke 10, was also present in John 20, verse 22, when Jesus breathes on them. And then an even smaller percentage, but still some of the same people from this group, are present in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them again. Now, wait a minute. This is already three times, three times, that these same people receive the Holy Spirit. Again, not all of them present in every group, but there was definitely carryover from each instance. So some of the disciples in Luke 10 were definitely present in John 20, 22. And some of those same men from John 20, 22 were definitely present in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And still, many of those who were present in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, were present in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, where the scripture says that these same believers prayed and received a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit's power. In fact, I want to show you this. This is incredible when you see it. Acts chapter 4, let's go to verse 23. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. Okay, so Peter and John, Peter and John, we're definitely a part of this group in Luke 10, John 20, 22, and Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Peter and John 
who had already received the Holy Spirit, who were definitely born again, who were preaching the good news, casting out devils, healing the sick, who had received the gift of tongues in Acts chapter 2, Peter and John, they were among this group of believers in Acts chapter 4, and look at what happens with them. This is so powerful. Acts chapter 4, watch this now, verses 29 and 31. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. I thought that was so interesting. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Well, did not Peter preach the word of God with boldness in Acts chapter 2 when 3,000 people were added to the church that day? Did not Peter declare with boldness the goodness of the gospel message? Did not Peter drive out demons? Did not Peter heal the sick? John also. But then the scripture says, then they preached the word of God with boldness. What was this describing? It was a fresh boldness coming upon them. It was a fresh power moving in them. It was a fresh influence, a new dimension of surrender to the Holy Spirit's power. So again, Luke 10, Holy Spirit moving through them. John 20, 22, they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 1 through 4, they received the Holy Spirit again. Acts chapter 4, they're filled with the Holy Spirit again. What is this describing? Does the Holy Spirit come and go? By no means, the Holy Spirit does not come and go. I'm going to show you now how to activate that power. Because we see in Scripture, number one, that we receive that power at salvation, and then we see that there's different levels of surrendering to that influence. See, each one of these examples in Scripture is not really an example of these people who are again and again receiving the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily them receiving more of the Holy Spirit. Each instance was the Holy Spirit receiving more of them. Why? Because it was a new level of surrender. It was a new dimension of power. It was a fresh touch of his influence. And so we see then how we move now into activation. So let's establish some things first. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Absolutely, positively, if you are born again, the Holy Spirit dwells in you in fullness. And that power must be used. You know, whenever I talk about activating the power of the Holy Spirit, People become a little uncomfortable with that, and understandably so, because that language, that description, how to activate the power, implies that we haven't yet received him. But that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is you receive him at salvation, but you've got to do something with what you've received. You have to do something with what you've received, because if you don't do anything with what he's given to you, what's the purpose of having received it? I mean, think about the fact that the Holy Spirit gives you the desire to pray. Does that mean your prayer life is 100% of the time absolutely positively consistent and effective? Well, no, not in every case. The Holy Spirit gives you the desire to read the Word. Does that mean that you're 100% always consistent as you should be, disciplined as you should be in reading the Word? By no means. Some of us falter in this area. The Holy Spirit gives to us love, joy, patience, and peace. Are we always perfectly loving, joyful, patient, and at peace? No. So if the Holy Spirit gives us these fruits of the Spirit, and we still have to live in a certain way that would cause those fruits to manifest in our lives, then why wouldn't the same be true of His power as well? I'm going to show you how this works. You must understand your own nature if you're going to understand how the Holy Spirit flows through you. If this is blessing you right now, then live or on replay, I want you to write in the comment section, Amen. Watch this now. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Say this in your mind. Say this out loud if you want to. I am a spirit who has a soul that lives in a body. I am a spirit who has a soul that lives in a body. You are not your body. You are not your soul. Your true identity is in the spirit. Now, let's break down these components. This is important. I know that perhaps you've heard these teachings on body, soul, and spirit. But I'm going to bring this out in a way that's directly applicable to activating the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. So now that you understand the nature of the Holy Spirit in that he moves in different levels depending upon how much we surrender, I want to show you why this applies to you. I'm going to show you something 
in the spirit that's a deep spiritual mysterious reality that if you understand it will actually begin to cause you to see things consistently in scripture and there will be no more contradictions or questions at least specifically as it has to do with the power of the holy spirit watch this now body soul spirit body soul spirit your body is your earth suit it's your flesh it's 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 your skin and bones your muscle your physical body this body is how you interact with the world around you. It's not inherently evil. I know, uh, according to certain religious mindsets, that the physical body is considered this depraved, ugly thing. No, in fact, the body is beautiful. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, as the scripture says in 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Your body is a carrier of the glory. Your body is a host for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Your body is holy as unto the Lord. It's a gift. It's something you ought to take care of. It's something you ought to use as an instrument unto the glory of God. The body can carry the atmosphere of heaven manifested in a tangible reality everywhere that you go. Your body can be like the Ark of the Covenant that carries the glow of the glory, the smoke of his presence, that essence of who he is. When you take your body into rooms, it should shift the atmosphere because of the glory that rests on your physical being. That's the power of hosting the presence of the Holy Spirit. So your body, though, can also be used according to sin. And this is where you have to really be careful when looking at the scripture. Because sometimes, and this is such a key point here, sometimes when the body is talking about the flesh, or when the, when the Bible is talking about the flesh, when the Bible references flesh, sometimes the scripture means the sin nature. And in other instances, when the Bible is talking about the flesh, the Bible is literally talking about the physical body. So you have to be careful when looking at the scripture, look at the context as a whole, and try to decide, based upon the context and careful study of the word, whether the Bible is describing the flesh as in the sin nature, or the Bible is describing the flesh as in the physical body. Because it clears up a lot of confusion. Like, for example, when Paul the Apostle wrote that he had a thorn in his flesh, he wasn't describing his earthly body. It wasn't saying there's some spiritual being in his body. He was talking about something in the nature of his humanity that was causing him to be bothered to where he needed to lean on the grace of God. So it's important that we get this right. So your body is your earth suit. Your body is your connection to this realm. Your body is how, again, you interact with others. Move on now to the soul. The soul is the neutral ground, the realm of decision. Your mind, will, emotions, what you think, what you desire, what you feel, your personality, how you behave. This is where you exercise the free will. This is where decisions are made. This is the essence of you, at least a certain layer of your identity. We're going to get into the deeper part in just a moment, but that personality comes to the soul. The mind is the soul. The will, the emotions, that's all the soul, the realm of the soul. And this is what rests in your body. Now, let me show you something interesting here. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, this is what's interesting to me because when Jesus is talking about the destruction of the human being in the place we call hell, he doesn't mention the spirit. He only mentions the fact that God destroys the body and the soul in hell. Why is this? This is because those who are born again of the Spirit do not experience the horrors of hell. They don't experience the fullness of the wrath of God. They don't experience punishment in the afterlife. Rather, this is reserved for those who are not of the Spirit. So, in the unbeliever, there is a body and a soul, but there is no Spirit non-existent, not asleep, not comatose, non-existent. That's what the scripture teaches. So the soul is not missing from this. The body is not missing from this. In this verse, we see the spirit missing. Why? Because those who are born of the spirit are not destroyed in this manner. So before you were saved, your spirit was dead. When you were saved, you were born again of the spirit. And so therefore that human being is not destroyed in the lake of fire that who consists of just soul and body is those who consist of just soul and body body are now let me show you the third here i have to speed this up because we got a lot to cover in activation so body that's your earth suit soul that's the realm of decision mind will emotions that's your personality 
Your spirit is your connection with God. Your spirit is the source of your identity. Many of you know I greatly admire the late Miss Catherine Coleman. And she was being criticized in one instance because of her past. Well, actually, she was criticized in several instances, but the story I'm telling is just one instance. And people knew that she had gone through a very rough divorce, and people knew that she had made mistakes, and people knew that she wasn't perfect. And so a woman decides to come up to Miss Coleman after Miss Coleman had finished preaching. And the woman tells Miss Coleman, You shouldn't be preaching the gospel, you're divorced. These are the sins of your past. And the woman just goes on to berate Miss Coleman regarding her past mistakes. And Miss Coleman, very graciously, is just listening to this woman as this woman is criticizing her and telling her why she shouldn't be in ministry. And then, in the way that only Miss Coleman could say it, she said, Oh, my dear, I believe you have me confused for someone else. Confused for someone else? What did she mean by that? Did she mean that she wasn't responsible for her wrongdoing? Did she mean that she didn't decide to make mistakes when she made those mistakes? No. She wasn't trying to get rid of the responsibility of the mistakes she had made. She was simply choosing to not identify with that part of herself. She knew that her identity rests in the spirit, not in the outer shells of who she is. So in your spirit, you are connected with God. That is the source of your identity. This is true. who you truly are. This is the very depth of your being, the core of your humanity. This is who you are. Who you are in the spirit is who you truly are. Who you are in the spirit is who you truly are. You may at times feel like a fake because of the mistakes that you make because of the sins that you commit, that you're trying to overcome, that you grieve over, that you're trying to work repentance over. And at those times that you sin, you may feel like a fake. I have good news for you. When you sin, you are absolutely a fake. You're a fake sinner. That's not who you really are. You may look at yourself and say, oh, I feel like such a hypocrite. I feel like such a failure. You may say things like, oh, I feel like I'm just, I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing. No, my friend, you're not a wolf in sheep's clothing. You're a sheep wearing wolf's clothing when you sin. It's not who you really are. It's not the basis of your identity. That's not who you are in Christ in the Spirit. Yes, the outer shells of who you are are your responsibility. Yes, what you do in the flesh is your responsibility. Yes, there are always consequences to sin. But when it comes right down to it, my friend, I'm here to remind you that no matter what you face, no matter the difficulty of your struggle, no matter how many mistakes you make, if you are born again, your true identity is not based on the body, not based on the soul. Your true identity is in the spirit, the deepest part of who you are, that part of you that's connected with God. Now, let me show you something in one of my favorite portions of Scripture right here. 1 Corinthians 2. I'm going to read, uh, let's read verses 10 through 16. Watch this now. This is incredible. But it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit. For His Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. That right there is already, there's so much packed into that. But let's keep reading and then we'll start to unpack these Scriptures. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the spirit using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual, that's you, it's talking about you right here, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? That's a rhetorical question, but watch this. See, so many people read that verse and they kind of just accept the fact that they can't know the Lord's thoughts. That's not what the scripture teaches. This is, this is amazing. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? Watch this. But we understand these things. For we have the mind of Christ. Now, a side message I could possibly do one day, 
Here the scripture is described describing the Holy Spirit as the mind of Christ. That's one of the titles that the scripture gives to the Holy Spirit. But watch this now. Let's break this down. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. Think about this. The Holy Spirit knows all of God's thoughts, not one missing. The Holy Spirit understands all of God's ways. There's nothing about the ways of God that the Holy Spirit doesn't understand, for he is God. I mean, I reference Psalm 139.7, look at Luke 135. In Psalm 139.7, we see that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. In Luke 135, we see that the power of the Holy Spirit is equated with the power of the, quote, most high, and therefore the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. And here we see 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16, that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He is God, okay? So, the Holy Spirit knows God's thoughts, knows God's will, knows God's ways, understands God's power, and he communicates that, watch this now, he communicates what he knows of God's mind, of God's ways, of God's nature, and he takes these truths, and what does he do? But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. He communicates those truths to us. So the Holy Spirit communicates these, and this is why the scripture says, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. It's by the Holy Ghost that this understanding is given. It's by the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit, uh, it's by the Holy Spirit that, that the, the knowledge of God is imparted unto you and I. So then, watch this now. In your spirit, you already know God. In your spirit, you already have power. In your spirit, you already have revelation. In your spirit, you are already one with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord is what? One spirit with him. Psalm 42, 7 says, Deep calleth unto deep. What's, what's the Psalms describing there? It's describing the depths of your spirit communicating with the depths of God's spirit. It's your spirit joining as one with the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit knows God's mind, will, everything, and he communicates that to you. So watch this now. So the Holy Spirit who lives in you understands and possesses all of God's power in you. The Holy Spirit who has revelation of the mind of God has that revelation of the mind of God carried in you. The Holy Spirit, who reveals your identity, who are you? You are the righteousness of Christ. That's what the scripture teaches. So, in my spirit, I'm already righteous. You may say, well, it doesn't seem like that. There are some days when it seems as though I'm not very righteous. There are some days that seem as though I, I'm not really of the spirit. My friend, remember this. Within your spirit, you're already righteous. The rest of you is still catching up. In your spirit, you're already holy. The rest of you is just catching up. But who you really are is already established. Who you really are is in the spirit. That part of you joined with the Holy Ghost, deep calling unto deep. And therefore, watch this now, all that God has for you is already yours. Revelation, for example, when we learn something new about God or we come to understand a truth about who he is, revelation is not me receiving new knowledge about God. Revelation is when that which I already know in my spirit is given unto my intellect. Revelation is when that which I already know in my spirit is manifested in my natural understanding. And I'm not using manifested in the New Age way. I literally just mean it comes about. So, so, so that revelation of God in my spirit, I already know him. I'm already connected. I'm already holy. I already have joy, peace, power, grace, the gifts, all of it. And it's just a matter of getting what's in me to affect the outer shells of who I am. And now we come to the place where we say, God, I need more power. God, I need more peace. God, I need more love. No, you don't. Stop saying I need more of the Holy Spirit because he already dwells in you. You think the Holy Spirit is uncommitted? 
You think the Holy Spirit does anything half-heartedly? Do you think the Holy Spirit withholds from you? Not a chance. Jesus died that you might have that nature. Jesus died that you might have that new nature brought about in you. Do you think he would withhold what Jesus paid for on the cross? Not a chance, my friend. Everything that the Holy Spirit is and possesses is already in you. So it's not, it's not a matter of more power. Stop saying, oh, Lord, I need more power. No, you don't. All the power is already in you. Oh, Lord, I need more love. No, you don't. All his love is already in you. Lord, I need more peace for this situation. No, you don't. The peace of God is already in you. Lord, I need more revelation. No, what you need is for what you, what you know in the spirit to actually come about and be manifested in your natural intellect. Really, how do you get all these things? We say things like, Holy Spirit, fill me. I'd imagine that the Holy Spirit often looks at us and thinks, I can't fill you when you're full of yourself. A, a law of spiritual dynamics is that the Holy Spirit can only fill that which is empty. He can only use that which is surrendered, or he only chooses to move upon that which is surrendered. Not that he can't at any moment by his own power and sovereignty overcome any of our decisions, but he chooses to allow us to have the decision to surrender. So watch this now. That power is activated through surrender. It's not a matter of you getting more of the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of the Holy Spirit getting more of you. It's not a matter of you getting more power. It's a matter of you releasing that power. Well, isn't that what happened all throughout the New Testament? I mean, I think of verses like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where the scripture says, don't be drunk with wine, that would ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That phrase in Ephesians, be filled, literally implies continual filling. Not like the filling of a water bottle, but rather like wind in a sail. It's a continual experience, a constant infilling. The baptism with the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is both a well and a river. It's a reservoir from which we can draw, but it's also a river, a flow. It's both a one-time experience and a constant state of being. Look at those examples I gave you again. What were they anointed to do in Luke 10? They were anointed to carry out ministry, the power upon them. And then Jesus breathes upon them in John 20, 22, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, what did the Holy Spirit empower them to do then? I'll tell you. In John 20, 22, when Jesus breathed on those disciples, he gave them the power to wait patiently for the coming of the next wave of power. He gave them the power to abide, to be faithful. Well, isn't that something? That he would give them that which they needed to experience the next level of his influence. And then in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes. It's not as if the Holy Spirit just showed up in Acts 2. I think that's what we imagine sometimes. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit wasn't really there in Acts, until Acts chapter 2. Was he not at the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3? Does not Psalm 139.7 say that there's nowhere we can go to escape from his Spirit? Didn't the Holy Spirit hover above the face of the deep in Genesis chapter 1? Wasn't the Holy Spirit present in the Old Testament as well? Wasn't the Holy Spirit the one who gave wisdom to Solomon? Wasn't the Holy Spirit the one who caused the prophets to speak? So it's not like he just showed up in Acts chapter 2. Rather, it was a different type of influence. This was the empowering of the church. So in Luke 10, he empowered individuals. In John 20, 22, he empowered them to wait. In Acts chapter 2, he empowered the church. In Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, he gave them a fresh touch of boldness and an increase in miracles. These are waves of his power that come not from the outside, but from the inside. John chapter 7, verse 38 is another portion of scripture that comes to mind, where Jesus said that he that believed out of his innermost being, some translations say, out of his innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. And then in parentheses, the scripture very clearly tells us that when Jesus talked about these living waters, these, these rivers of living water, the, these, these, these rivers of water were actually a reference to the Holy Spirit. So then, Jesus is saying, out of your innermost being will flood rivers of living water. Now, watch this. Body, soul, spirit. Body, soul, spirit. When I receive the Holy Spirit, that's at salvation. At salvation, I receive him. Let that be established. But at surrender, I release him.
That's what we refer to as the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Well, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is simply the immersion of his power. It's simply a wave of his influence. It's simply a refreshing touch of the Holy Spirit's power on your life. That's what it is. And we complicate it. And we ask questions like, well, when does he receive? Do I need to receive him a second time? No, you only need to receive him once. But you need to release him again and again for the rest of your life. How does this work? From the innermost part of my being, my spirit flows living waters. Now watch this. From my spirit, the river goes to touch my soul. And then from my soul, the river affects my body. So the baptism with the Holy Spirit is not rain from above. That's how we pray, isn't it? Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, please. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I want more of you. We pray as if the baptism with the Holy Spirit, we pray as if the power of the Holy Spirit is like rain from heaven. But the power of the Holy Spirit isn't rain from heaven. It's a flood from within. It's when what is already in me begins to flow through me and affect the outer shells of who I am. That's how you activate the power of the Holy Spirit quite simply through surrender. You want his power, you have to die to self. You want his power, you have to pick up your cross. You want his power, you have to lose your life in order to find it. You want his power, you have to walk in obedience to God's word. Someone asked me one time, David, how do I surrender? What exactly do I need to do? It's very simple. Surrender to the Holy Spirit is not a feeling, my friend. Surrender to the Holy Spirit is strict obedience to His Word. Surrender to the Holy Spirit is strict obedience to His voice. Surrender to the Holy Spirit is Jesus in the garden just before His crucifixion, crying out, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's surrender. Every time that you choose holiness over sin, that's surrender. Every time you choose prayer over Netflix, that's surrender. Every time you choose, choose the sacred over the entertaining, every time you choose the sacred over the entertaining, that's surrender. Every time you choose to read the scripture, instead of scrolling down some social media feed, that's surrender. Every time you choose to walk out when a movie is filthy and get made fun of by your friends, that's surrender. Every time you choose to not participate in gossip, that's surrender. Every time you choose to say no to that secret sin, that's surrender. Every time you choose to give when your flesh wants to withhold, that's surrender. Every time you evangelize when you're too tired to do it, that's surrender. Every time you choose his will over yours, Every time you choose the stirring over the spirit, over the stirring of your emotions. Every time you bow to Jesus as Lord instead of yourself as Lord. Anytime you choose God over others. Anytime you choose the approval of God over the approval of man. That's surrender. Surrender is the utter giving away of your life piece by piece to die a thousand deaths a day, to say no to the flesh a thousand times a day, to say yes to the Holy Spirit a thousand times a day, to say, God, I'll serve you even when I don't feel like it. God, I'll serve you even though I'm facing trial and heartache. God, I'll serve you even when my doubt is clouding the judgment of my mind. God, I will serve you even when things aren't going the way I want them. God, I will serve you even if it means giving up my dreams to accomplish your will. God, I will serve you even if no one else goes with me. God, I will serve you even if my family and my friends call me crazy and I'm the only one with my last name serving you. God, I will serve you even if it means death to self. That is surrender, my friend. Surrender unto the Holy Ghost every part of your being. Surrender unto the Holy Spirit every aspect of who you are, to pour your life out like a drink offering and squeeze until every last drop has been given. To put yourself on the altar and not get off. To put your flesh on that cross and not to let it have a resurrection. To choose a lifestyle of worship. To choose a lifestyle of prayer. To consecrate your every day to lock yourself away in times of seclusion with the Lord as we see in Matthew chapter 6. To choose to say yes to the Spirit and no to the flesh. To subject that part of you which desires against what the Holy Spirit desires. To surrender all. Surrender everything. 
This is what it means to yield to the Holy Ghost, to surrender your life. That's what I want more than anything. So that you start to disappear now and they don't see you, they see Jesus. That's what I want more than anything. I want to see that power flow through me. To let him begin to mold and shape me to where my, my, my insecurities turn to confidence in who I am in him. To where my anger turns to patience, my confusion turns to clarity, my depression turns to joy, my anxiety turns to peace. My selfishness is dealt with and I begin to love others as Christ loved me. To where I can let go of offense even though I feel justified in holding on to offense. To where I can say no to every root of bitterness that would try to affect different aspects of my life. To where I adhere to the scripture even when it goes against what culture tells me. To speak the truth, even if speaking the truth causes people to lash out. This is surrender, my friend. Surrender to the, I sense such a strong anointing right now. I tell you, just get me talking about the Holy Spirit. and he's, he, the, the, You talk about him and his power manifests. That's what I, I know that's what you want. That surrender to, to him and, and to, to give yourself in that way, that's how you get power. You don't get power by taking an e-course. You don't get power by having someone lay hands on you. That, that will only work if you're doing these things. You don't get power by sowing a seed for it. My friend, you can't buy the anointing. That's sorcery. Simon the sorcerer tried that in Acts chapter 8 and he got rebuked for it. You don't get power with a title. You don't get the anointing by marrying into an anointed family. You don't, you don't have power manifested on your life just because you have a ministry business card or a website or a thousand ministry followers. Power comes through the death of self. Power comes through surrender. Giving yourself unto him and saying, Lord, anything you want to do with me, do it. It doesn't matter doesn't matter, doesn't matter. I just want to live unto your glory. And then things begin to happen. Things begin to manifest in your life that are transformative. I'll never forget when I first began to truly surrender to my friend, the Holy Spirit. When I first began to surrender to him in a meaningful way, suddenly supernatural manifestations began to abound. Suddenly things started, the way I talked started to change. The way I looked at things started to change. Everything about me started to transform and people who knew me best started to see a transformation. That's how you really know when the Holy Spirit starts to work in you. When people in your home take a second look and go, you're different. Something's different about you. And there are things that manifest. There are benefits that arise. Now, I'm going to read you briefly here and then I want to pray for you. Don't leave until we pray. This is key here. I want to read to you benefits and the manifestations that begin to happen in your life. But first, let me encourage you, if this message is blessing you, if you're sensing that anointing, if God is doing something in you, help us spread this message. All you gotta do is click that like button. And if you like what you're hearing, you, you, you enjoy ministries that are Jesus-centered, Bible-based, and Spirit-filled, then make sure you subscribe to Encounter TV. Encounter TV, we simply say, encounter the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So subscribe and be sure to click that notification bell when you do. Now let's get into these benefits. When you begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit in that way, He helps you to pray. Suddenly, there's this desire, this hunger to go and pray. You desire to lock yourself in the room and not go anywhere else. You just, you just want to be locked away with the Lord for hours. That, that is a real thing that begins to happen. See, before you surrender to the Holy Spirit, you hesitate. You maybe push prayer off. Your flesh doesn't want to pray. You're not, not really something you want to do. Your flesh fights you, and it fights you really hard on that. And, and when you begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit, suddenly now, 
There is this strong desire to just be locked away in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, the transformation is so deep that once you begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit in this way, not only do you no longer have to fight to get into the prayer room, but the fight reverses now. You see, before you surrender to the Holy Spirit, you, you, would, you would fight to get into the prayer room. It was a struggle to start, but once you begin to surrender to Him, it's a struggle to stop. You won't want to leave even for a minute. You'll be in your prayer room for an hour, two hours, three hours, and you'll say, okay, eventually I have to go. I have to go and get to work. You know, someone has to feed these kids at some point. Someone has to take care of these responsibilities. And it will take everything in you to pull yourself out of that prayer room. That's what begins to happen when you begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Another thing that begins to happen is as you begin to look over the Scripture, suddenly what was dull and lifeless because you were in the flesh comes alive. Guys, the Bible comes alive. It's electrified, it's, it's brilliant, it's illuminated when the Holy Spirit begins to breathe on your life in a fresh way. And as you go through the scripture, you're not falling asleep, you're not forgetting what you read, you're not misunderstanding, you're not having to start over because you realize you weren't paying attention as you were reading. Instead, as you begin to read the scripture, truths and realities of the Spirit begin to jump out at you. And as those realities begin to jump out at you, there's this transformation that begins to take place in you. And the word starts to cause you to become more and more like Jesus. He becomes your teacher. Well, doesn't John 14, 26 tell us that the Holy Spirit will remind us and he'll reveal the truths of what Christ has said unto us. And as you begin to read, you're highlighting and taking notes and things are jumping out in you. It's no longer this chore. It's no longer this obligation. It becomes an opportunity. It's no longer a discipline. It becomes a delight. And as you're reading through the scripture, your tears are pouring down your face as Jesus is made real through the scriptures by the Holy Ghost. That's one of the things that happens when you begin to surrender to his power. Another thing that happens is you gain power unto holiness. You see, you may be wondering how you're ever going to overcome that sin. You may have gone through cycle again and again and again. I'm talking to someone right now where you've gone through the same thing again and again and again, the same sin over and over and over, and you've mistaken regret for repentance. And they're not the same thing. And you tell yourself, I'm never going to do that again. That's the last time I'll commit that sin. Now I move forward. And then you find yourself in the same trap. You find yourself overcome with shame and guilt. The Holy Spirit breaks that cycle. And there will come a day, my friend, not only where you will not have to fight that sin anymore or where you'll overcome it when you fight, but the desire won't even be there. The Holy Spirit doesn't just help you fight against the desires for sin. The Holy Spirit takes away those desires for sin. I know that, that I may sound crazy. I know some people may say to you that would never happen, but I'm here to declare to you that the Holy Spirit's work goes so deep as you begin to surrender to Him that that desire for sin changes into a desire for the things of the Spirit. There will come a day where the sin that once tempted you will disgust you, where the sin that once was alluring you'll find repulsive, where the sin that you had to fight just to resist that temptation won't even be a thought in your mind because you'll be so full of His presence. You'll be eating the word and feasting on the goodness of God's presence to where you won't be hungry for the things of the world anymore. That's what begins to manifest in your life as you surrender, as you die those thousand deaths a day, as you begin to give your life unto the Holy Ghost's use. That begins to happen in you. Those desires change. Then he helps you to worship. Well, John 4, 24 tells us that those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Spirit in that it only comes by the Holy Spirit and truth in that it's a revelation. All true worship is a response to revelation. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to truly worship. You can sing without a revelation. You can dance without a revelation. You can jump up and down without a revelation. You can even blow the shofar without a revelation. But you cannot worship without a revelation. It's only when you've captured a glimpse of who God is that the Spirit is so inspired that worship begins to flow out of you. That's a work that begins to happen in your life when you lay down your life 
unto the Holy Spirit's control. You see glimpses of God's glory. Worship is giving God glory as you see God's glory, reflecting His image, becoming like Him as an act of worship. And that's what the Holy Spirit truly does. Worship is everything in your being responding to what you know about God, and only the Holy Spirit can reveal that. Now, you're not standing in worship services, looking around at people lifting their hands. You're not watching people have encounters saying, oh, I hope I have an encounter like that one day. Rather, when you begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit, His work is so complete that it begins to stir worship in your heart. That work begins to cause you to see God in new dimensions like you never were able to see Him before. You know, sometimes I get lost in worship, and it's not like just looking at a painting. It's like flying through the cosmos, passing the stars and the constellations and the planets, moving into depths unknown, discovering worlds that are mysterious and wonderful. God is eternity Himself, and when you worship, you get caught in the essence of who he is you get raptured in that presence and the Holy Spirit reveals his glory you go from glory to glory so now the Holy Spirit reveals God you respond in worship and because you respond in worship the Holy Spirit reveals more of God and it's this never-ending cycle of glory to glory to glory that's what the Holy Ghost does in our worship he ignites our worship he sets it on fire it's no longer dead or dry it's no longer lifeless you know no longer look at it like a therapy session. Well, if I can get into worship, maybe one day at a good worship service, I'll start to feel good. Maybe when I get into worship, my emotions will start to be stirred positively. No, you'll forget about yourself and you'll be so obsessed with the image of Jesus that everything in you will respond with praise and adoration. That's what the Holy Ghost does. Then you become convinced of your sonship. We read it in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 15 tells us that it's by the Holy Spirit that we cry, Abba, Father. You become confident in who you are in Christ. Galatians 3, 5 refers to the miracle-working power of the Holy Spirit. You start to see demons flee, sickness flee, prophecy flow, spiritual gifts become potent through your life when you begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit. He gives you faith, 2 Corinthians 4, 13. He gives gives you boldness acts chapter 2 he develops the character of christ in you galatians chapter 5 verses 20 and 23 these are just some of the many benefits that are brought about when you finally begin to surrender to the holy spirit to lay down your life that's how you activate the power of the holy ghost it's through strict obedience to his word it's through strict obedience to his voice it's that sensitivity to his person, to where you say, I don't want to grieve him. I want to please him. That is the work of the Holy Ghost. If you want that, say, I want that. Let's pray right now. You want that. I don't care if you're watching on the replay. The power is still here. I want you to write that in the comment section. I want that. Don't be ashamed of that. Publicly declare it, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you're stirring your people unto action. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've given us all power, all authority. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that we are victorious in you. And now I pray that we would put into practice the truths of your word. Now I pray that we would respond to the unction of the Holy Ghost. I pray that we would respond to his drawing in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, break every bondage. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Break every bondage, Lord. Heal their sickness and disease. Light their prayer lives on fire. Stir them unto true worship. Give them a love and a delight for your word in the name of Jesus. Father, these are your people. Touch their lives afresh. Lord, just as you did, in the scripture time and time again so we ask you do it now let there be a fresh flood of holy spirit power that's the anointing of the holy ghost coming on you right now let there be a fresh flood of holy spirit power moving right now father move through my being move through my hands right through that camera right to where they're watching in the name of jesus i thank you for the anointing of the holy ghost i thank you that your power is present I want you to begin to speak out in tongues right now, right out loud, right where you are. Father, stir them in the name of Jesus. Stir them in the name of Jesus. Wow, wow, wow. Such a strong anointing, such a strong anointing. 
if he's touching your life, I want you to write it right now. Let people know how the Holy Spirit is touching your life. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Now, now, don't turn the stream off. I know we prayed, but don't turn the stream off. I want you to hear what I'm about to say because it's very important. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1-2, through two, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the reality of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. How often... Do we get so caught up in the mundane realities of this world that we forget about heavenly realities? How often do we get so caught up in the mediocre that we forget the sacred? How often do we get so caught up in the natural that we forget the spiritual? God, I don't want to be earthly minded. I want to be heavenly minded. God, I don't want my mindset to be time bound. I want it to be eternity bound. I don't want to get stuck to the here and the now. I want to also think about the there and the then. I want to think about what happens in eternity. Now, let me ask you something. If you could make a difference in the life of one soul, would you do it? If you could make the difference in one soul's eternity, think about this. We're talking heaven and hell now. If you could make the difference in one soul's eternity, would you do it? If I said to you, I I know of a way that we can work together, that we've seen work before, that will affect souls, would you do it? Well, there is a way you can help us win souls. Listen, this ministry is experiencing great favor. This ministry is experiencing quick but steady growth, like quarter over quarter, we're seeing numbers grow in the impact that we're having in the people that we're reaching. And you say, Brother David, are you so concerned with numbers? Listen, as long as there is a soul unsaved in this world, I will be concerned with numbers. Why? Because every number represents a person. Every person is a soul. If you could make a difference, would you do it? If you knew that an act that you were capable of doing could affect the life and the eternity of an individual would you do it church this is no time for games this is no time to be earthly minded this is about souls and so i want to challenge you not so that you can be blessed though i believe you will be blessed not so that you can experience increase though i believe that you'll experience increase but for the sake of souls will you help me will you help this ministry Right now, your flesh may be fighting you. Your flesh may be saying, oh, there it goes. He's taking an offering. There he goes. He's asking for support. Quick, log out. Quick, turn the video off. Quick, guard your finances. No, 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 my friend. That's cynicism. That's of the flesh. And I pray today that God would cause you to see the blessing that it is to be a generous giver. I want to challenge you right now to go to our website right this moment, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. And I want you to pray about what to give. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how can I sacrifice for the gospel? And I promise you this, whatever you give to this ministry will be used effectively. We will use our resources with one purpose in mind, to reach more people. Join the thousands of believers from all around the world who've already become one-time donors and even monthly supporters of this ministry. Go right now, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Let's be heavenly minded. Listen, even if your gift makes the difference in the life of one person, just one, isn't that impact worth making? That impact is worth making if you have that one difference being made in the life of the believer. So I want you to go now, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Give that gift support today, support today. Make all the difference in the world. And I can actually read the names of people here who are giving to the ministry. And I can see your gift coming in from all around the world. Now, you may be wondering, you know, what do we, what do we accept? What kind of currency? Listen, you can give from anywhere in the world, one time or monthly. And I encourage you, give monthly too. I can see the Patrick family gave. Thank you, the Patrick family. Diane, thank you for your support. And I'm reading the names from people who've given at this link right here, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. So we see Elizabeth, thank you. Fuab, thank you. 
Diane became a monthly supporter. Thank you for your support, Diane. I so appreciate that. Wow, wow, wow. And the gifts are coming in from all around the world. And I can see it. Those of you giving on YouTube, on Facebook, on other platforms, it's all coming in right here. Wow, wow, wow. I can see all the names that come in, by the way, and I often read them. The names are becoming um, more and more frequent. So it used to be I could read every name. I read most of the names that come in, by the way, of those who give on the website. So I see Diana, Elizabeth, Fuab, the Patrick family. Mabel, thank you so much for your one-time gift. We so appreciate that. Your, your support makes all the difference in the world. But go right now, whether you're watching live or on the replay, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Give a one-time gift. And I want to encourage you to consider also becoming a monthly supporter with this ministry. Consider also partnering with us on a monthly basis to make impact all around the world. Now, if you enjoyed this teaching, then you will love how to know you are walking in the Spirit, nine important signs. In this teaching, I talk about the ways that indicate that you are truly walking in the Spirit of God.